In this first of several tutorials, we're going to talk about creating custom buttons for Clo, because it's really the details that can make your garment sing in 3D. It's, you know, we all get really excited when we first see sort of the big view of a garment and it's photorealistic or almost, and we can sometimes forget about the details, but I think it's when you bring people really up close, that's where you can really capture the imagination. Certainly when I saw some stuff that had been done by this company in Europe, where they showed some really close-up details and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe that's 3D. I really want to be able to do that. That's really believable. And that's when I started looking at, like, it's, it, it really is those close-up details that make or break your shot. So in Clo, you know, they've got some built-in button shapes and they're pretty ordinary. Um, and that's when I started playing with those and realized the shapes weren't, like, what I wanted to use in real life that I figured I was going to have to start making my own buttons. And so the first thing I did was how do I take what they've got built in and adapt it for what I want to do. Clo actually gives you a way of creating your custom buttons, but unfortunately the documentation is not great on it. So it took me a while to figure out exactly what was going on. And it starts with the fact that they give you these UV maps buried deep in the file system. Before we get into the specific maps in Clo, because if it's the first time you're hearing about UV maps, like the first time I did, I was like, what's a UV map? So I, I want to show you a little bit of detail about what it is and how it's used. So you understand what you're doing and how you can manipulate these to get the results you want. So first, let's go look at a button in Blender. When we're making clothing, we start with a flat pattern and then we drape it over a mannequin and then we wait to see what physics does with it and then we have to fiddle with it and fiddle with it and fiddle with it to make it right. Computer modeling your sculpting in a 3D space, like maybe I would make this button until it looked right and then in order to get an image of color or pattern onto an, something, I need to flatten it out into that flat pattern, like the one we start with. And the flattened out mesh is known as a UV map. These blue rings here are where seams are determined to help flatten this out. So I'm going to open up a UV editor window of this and we'll look at it. So here's a UV map of the button, and there's a couple things that I want you to observe in particular. So it's, it's obvious these holes represent the holes in the button, and this flat area is the flat area of the face, and then this very detailed area is the rim. But then notice the edge of the button around the very edge is still attached. Now, if this were a flat pattern in paper like we would make for clothing, you couldn't really do this because we know that you can't flatten that shape out like this. But in CGI, we've got a little bit of more leeway. This would sort of distort the pattern, but if it's on an edge, maybe you don't, we don't care. Um, in this case, we, we don't really. Uh, there will be instances like, let's say I wanted to put some writing around the edge. Well, this particular UV map wouldn't work for that because it was distorted. So we will see how to do that in later tutorials, but for this purpose, we'll just leave it as like this right now. Um, this area right here is actually the cylinders inside of the, the, the button holes, like this area right here that's been flattened out. And then these tubes, these are the thread. So knowing that this is sort of the map of the button where we're going to project a texture, um, I hope it's it's a little bit more clear what this ring represents so that when we're later we're adding some graphics to it, we know what's important to line up and what's less important. So now let's go into Photoshop and open the Clo um, UV map that they provide that goes with this. So you gotta go to your C drive and then go to users, public, public documents, clo, assets, materials, hardware and trim, button and a buttonhole, button, UV, texture maps. There they are. So I chose the first 
so through button number one. So that's going to be open. If you had chosen a different button, you find the appropriate map. And we open that in Photoshop. So I know the path was really long. I'm going to have cheat sheets written out on the blog post with the path so you don't have to scramble to write it down now. It's easy to find a lot of source images on the internet of buttons and trims and things, but it's really important that you be very selective about the image you choose. It's important that it's taken from straight on so you have no kind of perspective distortion, um, so you don't see angles of lines. Uh, your button's a perfect circle, otherwise it's going to be very difficult to work with it in Photoshop later. Um, here's a beautiful image of a button that's got some nice detail, but the highlights might be a little difficult. So instead, I'm going to choose this one, which is a little less detailed, less pretty, but it's a better sort of flatter light profile, and that'll be easier for me to use. So I'm going to take this photo into Photoshop. So the tool we're going to use here is the Ellipse Marquee Tool. It can be found in this toolbar behind this rectangle. If I left click and hold, a flyout menu comes out, and I select the Elliptical Marquee Tool. It's a little bit goofy. To get a perfect circle, you would hold shift, the Shift key and left click and drag, but you notice it travels. So still holding Shift, I'll hold down the space bar, which allows me to reposition, and then when I'm ready to start Selecting again, I let go of the spacebar, but still holding shift, and it travels some more, and then I just keep repeating that spacebar, not spacebar, always holding shift, until I get a selection that I like. There. So now that I have my selection, I'm going to copy that and paste that in there. And it's a little too small, so Control T and hold the Shift key to constrain it to a circle. I'm going to scale it up, and you know I'm going to reduce the opacity about 60% so I can see what I'm doing. And right about there. Now, close documentation, they want you to match these holes to the holes of the button. But really, the holes don't always match. And you can make these match, but then you have to resize the edge and more important details of the button. And I would rather match sort of the major landmarks of the button to the map and then deal with the holes later. And I'll show you what it looks like without correcting for this and correcting for some of the edges. And then we'll come back and correct them after. So I just, I want you to understand why I'm doing some of the steps I'm doing. So we now have this button. Now we need to fill in the edge. And the easiest way to do that would just be to take, you know what, let's go hide some of these extra things we don't need. And we don't need the Korean or English. Okay, so I could take my button, Control C, Control V to copy it, Control T to scale it. And in this case, you wanna go over the edge just a little bit, just to make sure you don't have any, any gap in your texture. So right now, what's going to be sort of the outer edge of the button is sitting on top of the front of my button. So over in the layer stack, I just drag this one beneath it. So there's the top of my button. You see I have some, some little edges here, some points, and they're probably going to be not so pretty. So we're going to come back later and fix this, but we're also going to leave the holes as they are so that you see what I mean about some of the problems that the holes can cause. Um, so here's the back. I'm just going to copy another color and I'm going to leave this empty so you also see what goes on and why it's necessary to do that. So at this point, what I would do is save this as sew through button. Let's call this sew through horn so we know which one it is and change it to a JPEG. So here we are in Clo, and how we apply what we just did is we go into the texture. And this is not like when you're adding a texture for your cloth, which is a tileable texture, so you just drop it in and it repeats seamlessly. Because there's actual physical landmarks on the button, you can't just tile it, and that's why we used 
that map so we can project the right parts of the button to the right area. So in the parameters of the button, I'll go down under the material and normally I would have changed this to plastic. Well, yeah, let's change it to plastic. So we get a little bit of a shine and then we're going to grab the texture and the texture is going to be our button horn. This is the one we just made. So you see how the inside, you see that green? That's this area. And that's why we need to fill that. You see that green, but also, uh, you see around the edge here where it cuts off and it, it doesn't look convincing, doesn't look real. So we're gonna go fix that. So I don't want these colors showing up anymore, so I can just hide them make them invisible and then I'm going to flatten the image because it'll make it easier to copy and paste so I'll right click on the layer stack and hit flatten image and it's okay to discard hidden layers so remember we don't want this in fact in this case it wouldn't be green it would be gray so we use the rectangular marquee tool make a selection hit control C control V and drag it over and drop it there and then if I hold the Alt key, I can just drag and drop three more sections that will cover the holes up. Oh, I forgot the holes. You see how the white holes don't coincide with the actual holes of the button. So it looks terrible. Um, so instead of worrying about lining up the holes, like Chloe would say, okay, line up these holes with the holes. Yeah, but then the edge of my button is not going to be right. So I'm just going to use the clone stamp tool to get rid of these holes. In fact, if I make my brush a little bigger, I can just punch them out. Just grab an area next to it. Let's change the hardness. These little areas, I want to smooth them out so the edge of the button looks much more realistic and pretty. So I'm just going to take these hard lines out. And again, because it's horn, it's very forgiving. So you can do lousy, hacky Photoshop jobs like I'm doing now. And it's not really all that obvious. Just paint around. And this will look much more natural. So. Let's save this again. Let's just call it horn this time, just because I don't want to type and change it to JPEG. And go back to Chloe. So we see the holes, we see the green, we see these ugly little, these ugly edges here. So if I go back and I change my texture and I put the new horn, boom, see the inside of the holes are nice. The holes are gone and that ugly ring is not there. So it looks much more like a normal button, but wait, the thread. So the thread looks kind of gray. Um, normally in Chloe, the thread uses the same material of the button, but in this case, we're going to not do that. I don't want this texture. I just want like a brown color of thread. So I'm just going to go grab a brown color that looks right. And come on. there. So that's changed. Um, you can even change from plastic and fabric shiny or satin or matte, depending on what kind of thread you want to sew with. I mean, we're really getting heavy in the details, right? But one thing I notice is that they look kind of more like wood than horn. And the reason for that is something called subsurface scatter. So horn kind of has a natural glow to it. And that's one of the things that makes it very beautiful. And what's going on is that in this case, in the preview, the light rays are bouncing off the button and they're bouncing straight off the surface of the button and they're coming up to the eye and they're scattering a little bit. And so what we perceive is a very solid object. But with things like 
wax or marble or skin or horn buttons, there's a translucency, which means the light goes in, but it doesn't cut straight through like glass. Well, glass doesn't go straight, it refracts, but it's still, it's passing through pretty easily. With these materials, the light, which usually travels in straight lines, penetrates the surface of the button and then is scattered in all sorts of different directions, which makes a very soft glow. So if you think about if you were to hold a flashlight behind your hand, you would see that glow during certain parts of your skin where the light is being scattered. Well, the same thing is happening with horn buttons, especially in these lighter areas. Normally you would see more of a translucency. So how do I achieve that? I would change this uh, material type, not the thread, let's go back to the button, change this from plastic to skin. And this is pretty new to Clo and it's exciting because this is where you get some of the subsurface scatter. When I refresh, you're going to see right away that we start getting more of that depth of color and light. And instead of sort of looking like solid wood or plastic, you're getting some of the penetration of the light and some of that scatter, so it looks a lot more like a horn button. And here's my final image. I'd wanted to spend a bit of time looking at some of the post-processing I do to make it look more like a real photo, but we're kind of getting long, so we'll cover that in another post. But next, I want to look at how we can start sculpting our own button shapes in case the shapes that Chloe provides us don't meet what we're trying to achieve in real life. So I'll hope you'll join me for the next one.